Coming up on episode 21 of the Art Podcast, we wrap up our coverage of our studio conf with a conversation with Dirk Edebutel. We discuss his impressions of our studio conf, the current state of RCPP, and his perspective on Linux in the world of R, plus a batch of listener feedback and highlights from the R community. Without further ado, episode 21 begins now. Are you ready? Hi everyone, welcome to episode 21 of the Art Podcast. My name is Eric, and thanks so much for tuning in and whatever your preferred method of listening is, um, whether it's on from iTunes or from your Android podcasting app, whatever have you, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, th- and I want to thank everyone for some kind words on the last couple of episodes that have been covering our studio conf. And today's episode is kind of our, our wrapping up of all the coverage for that um, very exciting conference. And um, before I dive too much further, I just want to highlight some administrative things. I am aware that the um, audio quality of the last episode is not quite up to my standards because I admittedly did not do the best job of post-processing all of the audio, but um, I'm going to do a much better job of that today, and hopefully it'll be an easier listening experience on your on your preferred, you know, listening device. And um, also, I have gotten a lot of uh, requests lately about is there a possibility of making a YouTube channel um, for the Art Podcast? And I am definitely thinking about that. Um, I have some ideas that could hopefully make the viewing of that at least a little bit enjoyable, even though this is primarily an audio, you know, format, you know, podcast. But I think I have some ideas that could at least make it a little more interesting than just looking at um, a static screen. And I'm actually crossing my fingers that I can get uh, someone who's really, really smarter than me in terms of graphics to help out with the podcast. So that's in the works, and hopefully I can get something going there. Um, But as always, um, I want to, again, thanks everyone for their feedback now that I've launched the podcast back up. But um, let's go ahead and get started with our main topic for today, um, a conversation with Dirk Edebutel. All right, we are on location once again at Art Studio Conf. We had just wrapped up the last session. It was a panel discussion with um, Joe Rickard, uh, Joe Chang, and Hadley Wickham, um, and then... Um, and J.J. Ware, of course. But um, while I had a chance as things are wrapping up, I have the pleasure of welcoming one of the very first uh, key members of the R community that I started following because I've been a huge user of what he has done with RCPP. I'm very uh, privileged to welcome Dirk Edebuehl to the show. Dirk, uh, thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, we have just wrapped up our studio comp. So give me your overall impressions, especially as it relates to the other um, R conferences that you've personally organized or have attended. Um, just give me your feedback on that. It's very, very good to have a chance to come to a place and meet other um, community members and people one works with and sometimes only over email and, and other electronic means and just meet face to face. The size is about right, 390, 400 people. It's a bit larger than the conference that we do in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, parallel tracks always leaves you with a little bit of regret because you're in one room and you have a fear of missing out of what's in the other room. So I yes. kind of like single track better, but it's mm-hmm. it's it's good. This one's very focused because it's by our studio around a lot of our studios so we heard a lot about shiny and other things and not so much R in general but then again these guys have been so good to us and so successful that they definitely deserve a little bit of limelight and the little bit of focus in a way doesn't doesn't hurt because it was meant to be our studio conf not not some general all things everything so i've been to two earl conferences and 
the one comment I would make about those, they were very well organized and well run and put together by Mango, but mm -hmm. a little less cohesion because Earl is an acronym that stands for um, what the E, uh, but applications in the R language. Yeah, I know. So it's, 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 very, it's very right. much about application, right. and then those come from all different problem domains. So that makes it a little, a little harder to find a common common thread and common theme. Um, mm -hmm. User, of course, doesn't have that, and by design, and that's too big now. There's multiple tracks as well. So, but yep. yeah, yeah, conferences are good, and you know. Living further north, it's nice to get out in January to As get some reason. As someone who also lives in the north, I yeah. appreciate that. It was great to some, get some south. Sunshine's in, uh, some sunshine in Florida. Yeah, so Absolutely. It was, it was a great weekend. Very good, very good. And um, uh, Dirk uh, actually gave a great presentation on RCPP uh, today, which I have attended, and I will be the first to say I'm a complete novice to it, but gave me some things to follow up on for, for some of my work that I, when I get back to to my desk um, but if you could just spend a, a little bit to talk about you know what the current state of RCPP is from your standpoint in terms of the current functionality and what kind of things you think are on the roadmap uh, to enhance RCPP in, in 2017. Yeah we're at a pretty good point because usage still keeps increasing um, at a very steady pace it's I think getting to the point that there's almost a new package using it a day on CRAN. I mean, we're, we're getting towards 30 new ones a month. Maybe it's just a little bit less. We just crossed 900 a couple of days ago, and it was quiet for a few days, and we had seven this week, uh, so it's 907. Um, the feature set is pretty complete, so we, we don't really have a have a big roadmap or plan about what needs to be added I mean okay. for our smaller project on a smaller scale very much like what the R studio folks said in the room it's sort of you got to be nimble and flexible and work on the the problems as they present themselves rather than, than working out a huge a huge roadmap so it's it's good we have a we have a good team I think we're maybe seven now in RCPP core um, very good. participate with with sort of varying degrees of activity but when bugs come up I mean people are there to pay attention to them, f fix them. Um, we somehow managed to arrive at a very regular release cycle of just about every two months. And uh, a new version actually just came out about an hour ago. It just so happens because well, the previous one was, was, cool. in, was in November. So it was, it was mid-January and I had started running the usual pre-release tests uh, at the end of December. And you know there was one thing that needed a change and it mm -hmm. affected a handful of packages. And as per CRAN policies, I reached out to those maintainers, did the preparation to the release and all that. And, sure. and that was all good. So it was very, very short and sweet. I uploaded that this morning before the sessions and during the afternoon, I got an email back that it's, uh, that it's, that it's on. So that's very good. Um, that's good. So no great roadmap. It mm -hmm. does what it's supposed to do. And I think mm -hmm. we'll, we'll add fixes and features and things as we as we see them but the the basics the basics are there it covers you know most R types well enough um, it builds where it needs to build so we have this little bit of a um, for willingness to endure and do a little bit of implementation pain to be able to be used on on systems that are a few years old. I mean, mm -hmm. JJ reminds us of that all the time that there's still so and so many Red Hat systems out there with old compilers, and we can't quite close yes. the, the the door yep. on that because yeah. it's an infrastructure package. I mean, yep. we're, we're layer on the API. I right. have some application packages now that really demand C plus plus eleven, and they was. Uh, those don't build anywhere anymore, but that's they're, they're a bit more more specialized. That started with with Amadio when Conrad imposed that. So we are still trying to be um, to be broadly usable, not necessarily fall for all the newest features and tricks. If that would come at the exclusion of of some existing users and, and systems, so it's 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 okay. So no mm -hmm. grand plan of you know rewriting everything, and mo most things are there. And whenever we become aware of something that's not as good or performant as it could be, then then we um, then then of course we'll we'll address that. So open source clearly are still you know documentation could be more complete. Is right, there right. some initiatives underway to extend and rewrite so that yeah. that, that should get some well some one focus. Well, one thing speaking of that, I've been really impressed about is the RCPP website. You guys have done an excellent job with case you know gallery of examples, very good um, you know you know reference material there. Um, tell me how that came about. Um, how yeah, long actually, has that been made? Um, so that was an idea that, once again, JJ had because he knew of 
Jackal, which is a Ruby program yes. um, that f uh, works very well in the GitHub infrastructure. So we basically just post in our Markdown file and thanks to the magic of Nita and its ability to also consume RCPP code, it turns into um, what, what is now fairly common. I mean, a, a, a document plus code. So the, the code examples are actually compiled and run and we have sort of two workflows for that, one from C++ and one from, uh, one one from uh, RMD. Um, which we just stuck in there. And then with that, it was open to contributors. So, you know, everybody who solves an interesting problem can uh, supply it. I think we opened the door in 2013 and then wrote a lot of pieces to seed it a little to have enough, um, enough content to start with. And it's gotten a little quiet in terms of news stories, but every now and then when, you know, an interesting application or fix has just the right length of a few paragraphs, I, you know, I, I encourage people to, to submit it. And it's it's open. You very can good. submit by uh, by pull request. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I've been really impressed with the site um, for sure. Um, and one thing I noticed from your talk is obviously now in the RCPP IDE, it's very easy to launch a new package of RCPP and also to run basic, um, you know, functions in the RCPP framework. Can you tell me a little bit how you you got uh, how RCPP got integrated into the R Studio in terms of getting started with those well, things? Well, two of our um, and by our I mean RCPP uh, team of volunteers uh, core members are R Studio employees uh, JJ and Kevin. So they of course have a sweet spot for C plus plus two and then mm -hmm. wanted to use it. Uh, JJ and I often talked and joked about how how R really is now the command shell for all things data analysis, including a front end to C++ code, because it is now so easy to just launch an incremental compilation of just another function. So you can mm -hmm. you can almost interactively explore your C++ code, not interactively in the sense that the code would be interpreted. It, mm -hmm. it does not do that. But in, mm -hmm. an, in an incremental workflow, you don't have to leave your editor, compile, link, wait 30 minutes till the build is complete. So right, you can right. Really, really look at things, particularly sort of from a, from a data analytical perspective and, and workflow. It's, it's, it's a good environment. And so they've, they've helped greatly. Kevin, in particular, did a lot of the editor integration and actually talked about that today, too. That's what, true. What's, what's new in the IDE. So yep. a lot of that is actually is his work. And um, there's an extension that I talked about briefly that mm -hmm. the package templating is easier now. So packages can say when you want to create a new package using the features in this package, they can provide a hook that, that mm -hmm. Studio then uh, that then reflects uh, in the to be created new package application package. So it's it's, it's all good. It's it's good to have friends in high places. So uh, absolutely, R Studio has been really good for uh, for RCPP as well. Yep. Yeah, it's great to have that mutually beneficial relationship going there. Um, it, it's also uh, great to talk with you because um, we both I think are, are big fans of of course open source and Linux especially. Um, I admit when I was walking around the conference and watching whatever OS's people are using, it's still a lot of Windows and a lot of Mac. Um, I'll just put on kind of my open source enthusiast hat here. Do you ever think that we'll get to a place where Linux will have a more sizable share of desktop use? And from my bias standpoint, I think R plays so nicely with Linux as part of, you know, part of that ecosystem, the Unix philosophy of tools that do one thing very well, but it just integrates with so many other things. Do you ever see other people starting to use Linux um, in the future with, with R? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I've actually now use Linux on laptops for more than 20 years and there was definitely a lot more pain involved in the beginning. I'm actually quite happy with the experience. If you're a little bit careful in the hardware that you're buying that you and ensuring before you make the purchase that the parts will be supported because there's too many wireless chips, graphics yes. chips or whatever. But yes. by and large it's it's actually really good and maybe 10 years ago I would have said that the growth should continue and I think then I almost have seen more and it's it's just that the Mac and OS X have put a real dent into that and a lot of people who like, as to, to use Joe Cheng's term, who like a POSIX operating system then went with the Mac and, mm -hmm. and that too is at a funny juncture because there are some changes happening there that makes the Mac less developer friendly than it yes. definitely used to be 10 years ago and so yes. you see the odd blog post popping up for people who just you know, leave OS 10 and go to Ubuntu or Fedora or what mm -hmm. have you, and and so we'll 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 see. It's um, 
Um, I think we've long given up calling this the year of Linux on the desktop. Oh yeah, it's, that, that's it's, the um, twenty-year-old joke now. It seems yeah, like yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's still on mine now at work and at home. Um, I, I it helps my workflow, and as you said, yeah, R works particularly well on on Linux, but also on the Mac. Sure. And well enough on Windows because uh, the R core team has put a lot of effort into. Uh, an intermediary layer that makes uh, us access to all things system from file to networks and facilities and what have mm -hmm. you um, as, as, as standard and uniform as it as it can. There are limits in the panel discussion we just had someone asking again about you know can you make parallel computing easier and then of course the, right. the question just sort of comes back well which OS are you on and there are some fundamental things that Windows just cannot do the way it was built and we're just not yeah. going to see a change in in that but then you know the marches towards the cloud and many more things will just be lightweight front ends to things that that happen somewhere else so we'll, 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 we'll see we'll see yeah yeah well it's certainly been a great chatting with you um for those that want to kind of follow your your current developments what's the where are the places online that can follow you easiest yeah um i have a website at my domain so edelbittle.com it's dirk.edelbittle.com and there's um, slides from talks including today's and i blog there a little and tweet a little so um yeah, that's, that's a good place to start. And my name's weird enough that I have a good enough hit ratio for searches on uh, on Google. So if you want to find me, in most in most cases, you will. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for talking with me. It's been a pleasure to meet you. This is actually our second time meeting together, so I was able to bring the mics this time. We we got this out. So again, thanks so much, and um, hopefully we can our cro our paths will cross again in the future. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay, everyone, we will be right back. Okay, well, I hope you really enjoyed hearing that interview with Dirk as much as I did to talk to him in person. And that was actually the second time I met him in person because I was able to, by good fortune, meet him at the recent uh, JSM uh, conference that was held in Chicago, which, of course, is near his home base. But um, he, I recall for that conference, he, he gave a nice talk about open source software and statistics and Again, it's it's really fun to talk to people that kind of share your values in terms of technology and the open source philosophy. And um, of course, I always like talking to other users that put that use Linux as their primary driver, like I do. So, once again, Dirk, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me, and um, hope we can talk again in the future. Um, so, with that, let's go ahead and get into finally once again some listener feedback. Message for you, son. Okay, so we got a couple uh, pieces of feedback to share with you. Um, the first one comes from Jan, or maybe it's Yan. Um, either way, I hope, <laughs> hope I get one of the two options right. So, um, so Jan, I'm going to go with Jan. So Jan writes, Hi, Eric. Firstly, thanks for your podcast. In the previous one, you spoke about the R intro JS package and that you use it in your shiny apps now. I had a look at it and it is really nice, but I can't seem to make it work on an app with multiple pages, i.e. it doesn't go to a next tab in the navbar page. Just wanted to know if you found a workaround for this. By the way, I also use action links and modals to explain my apps. I should be asking the author, I know, but was just on your webpage now, so I thought I'd ask quick. I found a Stack Overflow solution, but couldn't make it work for me. So I'm hoping you have a magical, easy solution. Well, thanks very much, Jan. I really appreciate your feedback, and um, glad that you're also enjoying using uh, the R Intro JS package. So this this is an issue that um, I did encounter for one of my uh, more more uh, comprehensive apps that I'm doing at work that's based in Shiny. And um, for that particular project, I had the good luck of working with another um, full-time developer for it. And what we ended up having to do is, um, based on a variety of factors, we ended up um, looking at the, um, the uh, JavaScript library of IntroJS to do some custom tricks with at the time that we needed to fix um, an issue. And it was somewhat related to the nav bar issue that you're experiencing. And um, but in any event, it had been a while since we had you know came up with that. So I, after seeing your email, 
I went ahead and found that um, Stack Overflow post and tried it out with a simple toy app. And then at first, yeah, I was experiencing issues too. You do have to do some, you know, as um, some custom code in kind of this um, event portion of the call. But um, I, what I ended up doing is um, since I'd already contacted um, the author of our intro JS, um, Carl Gans, um, with a previous issue to deal with um, using our intro JS and Shiny modules, I ended up putting another issue anyway about you know the navbar issue um, that you've been talking about. And so I, but as I was putting on the issue on GitHub, I realized that, yeah, if I just tweak that custom code a little bit, then I could actually get it to work the way I was expecting it to. So what I'll do is um, in the show notes for this episode, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to the um, issue that I filed um, with, with, with Carl on the rintro.js GitHub repository. But I also asked him if he thought about doing a more elegant solution instead of doing that kind of custom coding for when to figure out to focus a particular tab as you're stepping through the different um, in input elements that you wrap with the intro box function. He is aware of it because it may work fine if you have a app with say maybe one or two or three, you know, nav bar kind of tab sets and then not many inputs within them. But in this app I have at work, I have, I would imagine at least 40 or maybe even 50 inputs spread around you know, seven or six of these navigation bars and each of them have like a bunch of little tabs within it. So the solution kind of that works right now doesn't really, I would say, scale very well in the situation where you have a very, you know, complex or, or a massive app. So I'm looking forward to what Carl um, has in terms of maybe a possible solution and maybe make a perhaps a new function to help with that processing of how to get the focus of those tabs to be in the right place as you're navigating through the through the help that RNGLJS provides. But um, once again, thanks thanks a lot for your feedback, Jan. I really appreciate it. Um, our next email comes from another Eric, albeit with a different spelling. Um, it's spelled E R I C H. So that's a unique one. I haven't seen that before. But anyway, he writes, "Hi Eric, I've started listening to your podcast starting from the older episodes." It's great. Your explanations are clear and very illuminating. I come from a SaaS background, as you yourself said in the first podcast. I'm quite used to the PDV concept, so understanding R code is a bit tricky at first. A question I have is related to the intersection between R and SaaS, notably PROC IML. Do you know anything about it? I understand it's SaaS's way of interpreting R, but I'm curious as to what's the difference between actually using R and PROC IML. I know there are some books dedicated to this, but I'd like to hear if the R community has tried it. Also, I understand some SaaS products, especially SaaS Enterprise Miner, has open source nodes for importing and using open source code, such as R, Python, etc. Have you used this functionality? Currently, I use SaaS daily, but I'd like to add some R functionality into SaaS, since some things are just simpler to write in R than SAS. Regards, Eric. Regards, Eric. So, Eric, thanks a lot for your feedback. And um, so I can, I can sympathize that as somebody that also started with SAS, that, yeah, learning R is a totally different paradigm. And this is an issue I encounter a lot, even to this day, in terms of getting um, some colleagues at work or, you know, colleagues at started with something like SAS and what are the best ways to teach them are. Um, certainly there are a lot of a lot of different ways of doing that, but of course that's not the bulk of what you're asking about. Um, so in terms of PROC IML, um, I have not used PROC IML very much and I have not used it in terms of with R very much, but I, I, I do have some feedback that I've learned from others that have used it. So basically, um, what I understand of PROC IML is that it is kind of a matrix-like language with some various built-in functions that maybe have some overlap with what R can do, but of course the syntax is going to be quite different. But what, what recent versions of SAS have allowed you to do is, of course, call R from PROC IML code. And so there's ways of kind of passing things back and forth as you do those calls. 
and again, I don't have a lot of experience of it primarily, but um, but they both obviously let you write your own kind of functions as well as using existing ones. Um, but what I would say is that um, that SAS IML maybe doesn't have quite as much in terms of what R can do. Um, so there may be some things in terms of statistics or even more um, novel ID, novel functions that IML is not able to handle. Um, you know, for example, I'm not sure if IML has various things for modeling, like mixed models or things like that. Um, but that you might have to jump into one of the typical procs in SAS, like proc limits or proc mix, to go back to IML after you get some results. And again, I'm just kind of speaking off the cuff because I haven't done it very much. Um, but what I will do is that as I was kind of researching to help answer this question as best I can, which admittedly probably isn't very good, um, I found an interesting uh, post on Stack, um, Stack Exchange, uh, the cross-validated uh, Stack Exchange where somebody was asking about experience with SAS IML and R. And um, there were some pretty good answers. In fact, one of them is from uh, Rick, who I believe um, is in the SAS community and has written a book about it as well. Um, so I'll put that, that um, post in the show notes. Maybe that'll help you out in understanding these things. But um, at least in my current day-to-day -day work, I haven't the only times I've really had to use SAS in terms of with R at the same time is if I had to do some rather um, intricate uh, model, say in proc mix, and I wanted to bring the results into R for further post-processing, but that was totally avoiding proc IML because it was just simply exporting the various things from proc mix, let's say a CSV like the LS mean stuff or other model fit stats, and then just using R on the back afterwards to to take all that in and do something with it. In fact, that was kind of an interesting situation because that was the first time I, within an R Markdown document, was able to call a different language in the, in the document besides R itself. So basically there were two chunks that called SAS. At that time we had it installed on a Linux server to be able to run these quick models and then bring those results back into R and then do something with it. But I could do it all in one document, which I thought was pretty cool. But anyway, I, I wish I had more experience of it, but unfortunately I don't. But of course, if we have any listeners that want to chime in and help out with, with Eric's question, please uh, go ahead and pass some feedback and I'll be glad to put it in the show note, uh, put it in a future episode. So once again, thanks a lot for, the, for those two uh, pieces of feedback, Jan and Eric. And if you want to provide feedback to the show, um, the easiest way probably is to go to the uh, home site at r-podcast.org and click on the contact link, which you'll get um, a very in, very uh, basic contact form, but that will automatically send me an email um, to, to get your message. You can also email the show directly um, at the rcast.gmail.com. I'll remind everybody of that again as we close the episode. But with the listener feedback done, let's go ahead and get into some of the R Community Roundup. So for this Community Roundup, I'm going to highlight a, a pretty major event that took place. Um, I believe it actually took place um, before the last episode was released, although I had not, at that time, I recorded all the content already, so I didn't have a chance to splice this in. But um, if you recall from, I believe, episode 19, when I was talking with uh, with Dean, we were kind of wondering when, what kind of package it would be when CRAN hits you know, the 10,000 package mark. Well, it has happened. As of January 27, CRAN now has more than 10,000 packages. And the package that did it was a package called Hurricane Exposure um, by Brooke Anderson. Um, I'll have a link to the, the CRAN page um, for that particular package in the show notes. But it's kind of interesting that it has to do with doing um, creating time series of these uh, tropical storm histories um, and, and valuing a couple of different metrics along the way and that it is bringing in some data from a different uh, package called hurricane exposure data. So it's not quite what I was predicting in terms of like an API type package, but you know, it's kind of close that, you know, 
if you think of data as an API as well. Um, but anyway, it's just a huge milestone. And there have been some various posts from the community that are now looking at this in terms of giving people some awareness on how to find packages, you know, the best resources around that. And so um, Revol um, I think David Smith had a nice post about looking at how to find the ones you need um, in terms of looking at everything on CRAN. So I'll, I'll put a link to that um, right up in the show notes as well. But anyway, it's just a, obviously a very exciting milestone in that who knows when 20,000 will hit, but either way, there's probably a package for what you're looking for. Um, and the other uh, piece of the, uh, roundup I wanted to put in is um, in terms of kind of where I'm going to get this information in the future, um, I remember when I first did the podcast, I was primarily looking at um, our bloggers as kind of the, my go-to in terms of what the community was doing. And that, again, is definitely one of my bigger sources of finding some interesting content um, to learn from and to share with all of you. But there are some additional methods that I've used since I've started relaunching. Um, back when I first did the podcast, I was not a very big Twitter user at all. And it's not like I'm a heavy user of Twitter, but I have, you know, realized the value of the um, R stats hashtag to find interesting things that sometimes don't make the don't actually turn into a blog post or, or other website that our bloggers would reference. So I found some interesting finds there. And then it was about toward the end of last year that I found this great new um, initiative called R Weekly, which comes out every Monday morning as kind of this um, this curated digest of interesting resources or tutorials, uses of R in industry and, and other highlights um, that are curated and, and given as a as a weekly blog that basically just has links to all these other interesting content. So I've started using that also to find some interesting stuff. And, uh, and as of about two or three days ago, or maybe a little longer, I've started to even submit some content that they could put into the put into the R Weekly Digest because they take pull requests. You just have to go to their 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 uh, GitHub repository, go ahead and edit the draft uh, the draft file, and then they they've accepted all mine so far. And I'm kind of I kind of like being able to contribute stuff back, so it, it's been kind of fun. So one find that I wanted to share with 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 in respect to this podcast was um. Uh, a post. Um, this also came from Revolutions about how Cran uh, uh, how um, the the city of Chicago was using R to help um, isol or help find out you know modeling and preventing uh, food poisoning in Chicago restaurants. So what I liked about this is that well, first of all, just from a practical standpoint. If you've ever had food poisoning, it absolutely stinks, and of course you want to know how do I how do you avoid it? Sometimes you can't avoid it, of course, but um, but I thought it was a really interesting case where they the city of Chicago used R to create some models that would predict which of the restaurants in their area were more likely to fail a food a food inspection. So that was really interesting because they were able to find which restaurants might be you know a candidate for not being safe enough, and that was a big improvement over their traditional methods. Now, of course, if we had just heard about this kind of and didn't really know the nuts and bolts of it, that'd be one thing. But their Department of Public Health in Chicago has made the, the code that did this available as an open source project on, of course, GitHub. So what I like about this is that it's not only, you know, those within, you know, this kind of, uh, pub, you know, sector of government using say the art tools like R, but they're sharing it for all of us to benefit. And hopefully those of us that are interested, we could take a look at these models and we find some improvements. We could always, you know, contribute that back. But apparently that's also been used um, in Maryland because there's a, I think it's Montgomery County, Maryland, also looked at using a similar process and they too found some improvements that they could use in their food inspection or food safety inspection uh, process. So. Um, we'll put a link to this uh, post from Revolutions in the show notes. But again, I just like the fact that it's not only using these innovative tools like R and the various you know modeling features inside it, but to be able to share this back for all of us to benefit um, for, you know, it is a safety issue as you think about it. So 
again, I thought that was pretty interesting, and I'll definitely uh, take a look at some of the methodologies that they use for these models as I as I get more time to do that. Um, but yeah, that'll, that'll wrap it up for the uh, community roundup. So the last thing we'll do for today is our package pick. So our package pick is going to kind of have some origins from our studio comp because that's when I first uh, heard about this. This package is called BS Plus, and this is coming from Ian Little, who, if you recall from a few earlier episodes, had made a nice package that was an, an example of uh, using Shiny modules. So he's been pretty heavily involved in the concept of Shiny and, and web web development, it seems like. and. I had a chance to meet him at our studio comp and he did a presentation on this package called BS Plus. So what BS Plus is, is that it's basically a collection of functions to add various uh, Bootstrap 3 styling um, items to your Shiny or R Markdown reports. So one of the couple of the features that caught my eye were the idea of um, adding tooltips um, in these little kind of buttons that appear next to the label of your inputs for say a shiny app and it's a very easy function to do so and then he also has a variation of the uh, pop-up modals that you can put in your shiny app and again he has some interesting ways of using markdown within that to render that is very nicely formatted html so this has a lot more features too and i've only um begun exploring it but once again, Ian does a really great job of structuring the package, following a lot of the best practices that have been outlined by, um, you know, the Hadley Wickham's kind of dev tools framework. And even he has a nice website that's the documentation for the package that's been compiled using uh, Hadley's uh, package, PKG down uh, package. Not sure how to really say it, but it just basically is a great way to create static uh, documentation that you could put in a website to, to you know, reveal your packages, you know, documentation. What else can I say about it? But anyway, um, Ian has really done a nice job of of forming this package, and I'm interested in kind of incorporating this in some of my apps in the future um, to kind of combine it with things like R Intro JS and some other utilities to give the user a little more um, user friendly experience, especially in the case of a complex app where they may see like as I mentioned in my feedback on on the RHOJS issue, I have an app that has probably at least 40 or 45 inputs that it would be nice that the user can just hover over something and quickly see what that what that input is supposed to do or just more of the methodology behind the app. So so again, uh, great, great job. Great job, Ian. I really enjoy your work and uh, hopefully you got some more interesting stuff on the way and I'll definitely be one of your first customers for it. Okay, I think that's going to wrap up episode 21. As I mentioned in the previous segment, if you'd like to um, pass any uh, topic suggestions, uh, feedback, questions, or other insights that you want to share, go ahead and contact me. You have various ways of doing that. You can use the uh, contact form on r-podcast.org. Just go ahead and click that contact link and send me send me a quick note. I'll be happy to read it on the show and respond back to you. Um, also, if you could also email me directly at the rcast at gmail.com. And then we also have a voicemail hotline where you can find a number for that on our home site. Also, you can leave a comment on this episode directly on this um, episode's posting on the R podcast site. So that's going to wrap up episode 21. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, end the line.